We probably all know somebody in our life who we love, who's just really far away from God. And that's heartbreaking for us. It's hard for us to see. And we maybe would wonder, is God ever going to break through to this person? Is the Lord ever going to give this person a profound encounter with himself and help them to recognize his love? I think that the story of blessed Bartolo Longo should inspire us with some hope because Bartolo was very, very far away from God and his life completely turned around when the Lord broke in. Bartolo was born in Italy, southern Italy, in the 1840s, and at the age of 10, his mom passed away. This really wrecked him, of course, and going into his adolescence, uh, and those, so those teenage years, it was really leading him into an, a, a darker place. And the t- at the time in Italy, things were messy politically, and there was a whole lot of anti-Catholic sentiment, and he was starting to get caught up in all of that. And uh, intellectually, he's drawn to me this intellectual movement that is also anti-Catholic. So by the time he gets into college, he's not in a great place, really. Uh, he says that by the time he reached college, He hated monks and priests and the Pope. He hated the church. He wanted nothing to do with it. And this starts to lead him into, in some ways, a depression. Uh, Over the course of these years, he's not really processing those emotions in the proper ways. And he finds himself in a dark place. So he starts to seek out mediums. We might call a medium like a psychic or a palm reader or a card reader, something like that. That's his first experience with the occult. And as he's starting to see these mediums, he finds himself like thirsting for the supernatural. Now, on one level, thirsting for the supernatural can be good, right? If we're thirsting for God, who is infinite, who is beyond this world, who is all good. However, because of his now involvement in the occult, he's actually drawn into the darker side of the supernatural. And he finds himself desiring now to enter into satanic worship and the satanic priesthood. So he enters into this time of study and incredible fasting that just decimates his body so that he could become a satanic priest. And he does. He becomes consecrated, a priest in in satanic uh, worship. He starts to offer these satanic services. He's preaching actively against the church, against the Lord. And he's not realizing it, but it's starting to do incredible damage to him psychologically, physiologically, And his family is really trying to intercede, helping him, trying the best they can to help him to recognize that this is destroying him, but he just won't listen. Finally, he does listen to a a Catholic professor who knows the family who reaches out. And this professor has to say, look, this is destroying you. You have to acknowledge that you're either going to end up in an insane asylum or dead. This starts to snap him out of this time of confusion. So he starts to spend more time with this professor, starts to talk things out. He starts to maybe engage the intellectual life when it comes to truth and goodness and beauty. He starts to distance himself, really, from the satanic stuff. And he starts to talk with a Catholic priest who eventually convinces him to go to confession, which in itself is incredible, right? We, that, that beginning again, that starting over, is possible for everybody, including the satanic priest. So he begins again, and yet he still struggles with a little despair. He still struggles with the, the, the doubt. He's not fully embracing the Lord's love for him. And so he, he describes this experience he had of, of going out for a walk, and he's, he's kind of mulling over this fact that he had consecrated his soul to a demon the day that he was uh, or made a, a satanic priest. And he's falling into this despair. Like, is there any hope for him? Yes, he's come back to confession, but he's given his soul over to the devil. Maybe the devil's got a stronger hold than God has. And he starts to spiral. And he says that he was seriously considering committing suicide. But then in that moment, on that walk, the Lord breaks through. The Lord comes to him in prayer, offers him encouragement, encourages him towards the rosary, And it it helps to make this cloud lift. He comes out of this fog that he's been in. And he recommits himself to the Lord. And he's now uh, choosing to share the rosary. He's choosing to talk about the Blessed Mother with everybody that he meets. This became like the goal of his life was to help people to encounter the Blessed Mother who shows us Jesus, who shows us the the good and, and faithful Father 
that we have in heaven. Pope John Paul II gave us the Luminous Mysteries in the year 2002. And he says that the inspiration for giving us the Luminous Mysteries of the Rosary was because of Bartolo. Uh, Blessed Bartolo had talked a lot about how we need to meditate on the life of Christ, not just his birth or his death or the glorious mysteries. We need to meditate on his life so that we can imitate Jesus. And he even gave some ideas of what some of these mysteries might be, these moments that we should reflect on. So JP2, when giving us the luminous mysteries, um, was doing so inspired by Blessed Bartolo Longo. So in some ways, his his devotion to the Blessed Mother, his devotion to the Rosary is now... Um, is now inspiring generations after him to love our Lord and Our Lady even more. So the story of Bartolo Longo is an inspiration for me and should be an inspiration for all of us that no matter how far away we are from God, even if we're falling into the depths of despair, we're in the midst of loneliness, even if we're far away from the Lord to reject him, the Lord always loves us and there is always hope because he's going to seek us out no matter what. Blessed Bartolo Longo, pray for us. Thank you.